Um, this is It's Your Estate, week two. Um, we're going through, and Christine is now here, and we will be talking about it. But first, I'm going to share my screen and run through a couple of slides just real quick. Uh, that one. So again, It's Your Estate, and that's where we are at the moment. There is a workbook which you can download off of the website at that same location as everything else. It basically is follows along in the process that we talk about, but it lets you think about some things and take notes. It's for you, use it if you wish to, don't. Um, that's there and available. Basically, we are now at week two, so we'll be talking about healthcare and power of attorney. Last week we did the others, and we will we are scheduled to stay in order in terms of wills, wills and trusts, retirement planning, charitable organization, opportunities, and estate planning administration. I'll get it right by week six when we're done. Um, anyway, so that's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go away. I'm going to be the proverbial voice of God. And if questions come in, I'm going to decide whether I ask Christine as we go along, whether I answer it or however we're going to handle it. So I disappear until there's a reason I come back. Y'all have a good time. All right. Thank you, Don. Good morning, Christina. Great to see you, Pete. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I love having you. And one of the things that we're going to do first is bring up your outline and your ask first form. Since you're going to be our first legal counsel uh, to present, I want to just go through a few things as to on the ask first form. Uh, Don, can you bring that up or is that on your, Christina's outline? Christina, do you, can you share, do, are you planning on sharing your outline or are you? That's my understanding. Uh, or to talk. I don't have an ask form to share. Okay. I have a physical one we can discuss. Uh, let's see. I think it's on the website. Uh, Hang on a sec. Working. Donna's going to get it. Working. God. Working. Or should I just hold it up to the Working. screen? Yeah, there you go. I like that. That's a really good idea. We'll do that one. <laughs> well, in the meantime, while Don is doing that, uh, one of the reasons why Christina is presenting in this particular area is, is that Christina is known as a, what's called an elder law attorney. Christina, describe what that is and why is it that a specialty versus other estate planning attorneys? That's right. I'm a certified elder law attorney, and I'm certified by the National Elder Law Foundation. And to qualify for that distinction, I had to show proficiency in 12 different areas of the law specific to persons who are over age 65 and also disabled folks. So that includes expertise in uh, pre-planning pre-mortem planning, that is also post-mortem planning. We know what the word morta means. And also special needs planning, retirement planning, um, conservatorships and protective proceedings. Um, and I had to show that in the last, uh, I had to have at least five years. I have 18 years of experience exclusively in elder law. Yeah, it's it's become its own specialty. So uh, if you have issues on this, seek out a elder law specialist and you can go to the Academy of Elder Law Attorneys and all you have to do is plug in your zip code and you can get a list of those specialists in your area. Um, 18 years of experience. Uh, uh, so I, why is that so valuable? Again, because there are uh, special issues that arise when dealing with seniors and or disabled adults. In particular, issues of capacity. And that's one of the first things that I'm going to be discussing today as we discuss powers of attorney and advanced health care. Um, there's a specialty within uh, determining capacity. Who can yeah. determine their own um, agents? Who can make decisions about uh, what they're going to leave behind in their legacy? Well, yeah. the ability to know the president, what day it is and spell world backwards really has nothing to do with it. I'm referring to the mini mental, if anybody's ever experienced. Uh, you know, I was trying to it figure doesn't... out how to spell world backwards. 
I would fail the mini mental, honest to God. And yet here I am having a license to practice law. So again, capacity doesn't mean that mini mental exam. It means a lot of other things. Do you know the alternatives? Do you know the uh, uh, the results of the decisions that you are making? Yeah. If you notice that she's not licensed as a CPA, that she's not licensed as an insurance person, or that she has a securities license. No, thanks. She's, yeah. And this is all positive. I would be very sus suspect of Christina if she was licensed in other areas. It's I've just so difficult just to stay up to speed in one area of specialty. And if you're more licensed in one area, uh, I, I would have doubts whether or not uh, that she's competent in the area that she that she professes to be in. License number is really important because you can look her up on the, the bar uh, association to see if she has any lapses. And I want to report to you she has not. <laughs> and then how do you charge, uh, Christina? Depends on the work. So today we're going to be talking about estate plan documents. And for me, that's going to be a flat fee, depending on what people need. So if a husband and wife comes to me and they have one house and a bank account and a couple of kids, we're probably going to do an estate plan that includes a will, trust, power of attorney, and advanced health care. And we're going to transfer the home into this trust. And generally, the fee for something like that is going to be about $2,500. And if the be person, more or less, depending on what they need. Yeah, uh, I want to just say one thing is, is that we're, we're going to be talking about married couples, but all of us will be single at some time in our life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what do you charge for a single individual who needs all these documents? Because if it's a single individual, it's even more important to have these documents. Right. Depending on what they need, it might be, say, if you don't own any real property, it might be about the sixteen or eighteen hundred dollars. Okay. But if you do own a home, probably about two thousand to twenty two hundred dollars. And wow. the variance depends on how complicated are your distribution plans going to be? Is there a special needs beneficiary? Uh, or do you need a support trust where a trustee holds on to the money and makes distributions to a beneficiary over a period of time? So more, the more complicated your uh, legacy planning, uh, the higher the fees. Yeah. But if folks just want to sit down, for example, and review their existing estate plans to see, does it still fit your needs and your family? My um, hourly rate is $475. $475. And during this uh, package price that you just quoted, does that include conversations with your staff or you during this period of time? It does. That's a flat fee. So that's from drafting and then a possible revision and then sitting down and signing it. Okay. But you know, there, there are those folks who, who, you know, there might be five revisions because they're, they, they disinherit and they get mad at people. Well, you know, there, there would be an hourly charge for yeah. that. And those comes in, let's, yeah, after you've done the, the, the documents and they come back in two years and say, we need to make changes those changes are usually done on an hourly basis. And do you usually give an estimate prior to making those changes as to what uh, your fees will be? Um, no, I charge a flat fee for amendments. I, okay. You know, I, you come back a year later and, you know, I just don't think this person is right for me as the agent trustee. for power attorney or trustee. That's right. And so that would be a flat fee just and to do an amendment of all of the documents that we just did. Oh gosh, it might be 900 okay. to 1200. Yeah, when you change a person, you gotta change your will, you gotta change your durable power, you gotta usually change your advanced healthcare directive, you gotta change the trust. So it's not- That's just, right. And, and if you're you married- about this Next <laughs> week that whenever you change your will, pardon me, whenever you change your trust, whatever the trust is, you, you have to do a new will. Yeah. There's a case law that says you must do that for it to be valid and and uh, to enforce the no contest clause. Very important. You'll hear more about that next week.
Yeah. And the other thing, too, is, is that wh whoever is the last attorney to make a change in your estate planning documents, they're going to be held liable for the changes that are made. So they want to make sure that your documents are in order. So when you receive a, um, a draft of legal documents and estate plan that another attorney that you're not familiar with and you need to review them and make a change, uh, a lot of times I would imagine that you would suggest, hey, let's keep the name and make uh, a, a change is called a restatement. How, how do you charge for that? It's the same fees that we had just discussed. A, okay. a restatement is almost the same as, almost the same as I sit down with a new family. Exactly. Okay. But, but it's worth it. Because let me tell you, you're going to find a lot of funky stuff in yeah. old trusts. Yeah. Uh, terrible things that you'll hear about next week, such as the AB split. What a pain in the neck. There's a reason why we used to do it for tax reasons, but no because longer. tax law changed so much that there are some really complicated trusts out there that people don't need all that administrative hoopla. Yeah. Okay. Let's get to your outline. Don, can you put her outline on the screen? Uh, and by the way, if you can uh, go to our website. <laughs> and Christine, do you have your presentation that you can show? Mm, I uh, she doesn't. No, she didn't have her. She didn't have her uh, ask first form. Yeah. So I think she has the outline on the uh, website. Uh, Christine, is that the way we need to go? Only because then I have to sit here and run it for you. Yes. It's okay. Am I sharing screen now? Yes, you are. All right. Let's do it. Okay. Go ahead then and, sh and present it. I want to make sure it doesn't switch to another screen. We're good. Uh, just to remind everybody that uh, Christina's outline is on our website, uh, I Y M E, and also her Ask First form is there. And there's also extra articles that you can read on your own and that are pertinent to the topic today. So, uh, Christina, it's all yours. Thanks, Pete. So, today we're going to talk about the ins and outs of fiduciary relationships. So when we say fiduciary, that word means somebody who must act in your best interest and not in their own interest. So the documents that we're going to talk about today are the power of attorney, the advanced health care, a little bit about the trust, and then we're going to talk about the alternative, which is Conservative. conservatorship. So uh, today we're talking about pre mortem planning. We're planning for you during your lifetime should you become ill or incapacitated and need assistance Christina, with running your affairs. Move move your slides forward because you're still sitting on your first slide. Yes, I'm still talking about my first slide. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought... <laughs> I'm not new to this rodeo, thanks. <laughs> so what I want to tell you about is that this is about uh, a lot of old estate plans only plan for when you're dead. But we care about you while you're still alive. And so that's why we're emphasizing the pre-mortem planning. Um, uh, one reality I have to talk to folks about is, you know, we think we're going to live and then we're going to die. But the reality is a lot of us are going to live and then have a period of time where we need support and help before we pass away. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Great. All right. So we're going to talk about, I said, the, the three major things we're going to talk about today are power of attorney for finances, um, advanced health care, and the trust. So let's start with the power of attorney for finances, because this is the most controversial of the documents, the most abused. And uh, the reason why I really wanted to give this presentation is years ago, I was at a senior center and I started talking about powers of attorney and somebody stood up and said, my friend signed one of those and her kids took away her home and put her in a nursing home. And that was just the most horrifying thing that the impression was, was this was how you end up in a nursing home and lose all your money and property. We said that this is a fiduciary relationship. That means the person you have selected must act in your best interest and your interest only. So uh, there's different types of powers of attorney out there that we should talk about. Um, there's durable powers of attorney and non-durable. 
Now, there's limited and there's general. And what that means is a power of attorney can mean, say, this person can do this one thing for me and this one thing only. A good example is the powers of attorney that you get at a bank. You can add somebody uh, at Bank of America or wherever by filling out their fiduciary form. That's in addition to whatever estate plan documents you have. And that would just be limited to that bank account. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but it, it doesn't allow them to call your credit card company and say, what's this weird Amazon charge? Yeah, or you're uh, on vacation and you're selling something and you give somebody the limited power of attorney to represent you in the sale of your house. And it usually expires. Whereas a durable power of attorney means that this uh, endures throughout your lifetime and even during incapacity, if any. So people should really look at their powers of attorney to make sure that it's a durable power of attorney. Does it have to use the word durable or can it state this is going to be uh, valid through incapacity? That's right. But let's talk about that. Where do you get these forms? Well, they're generally statutory, like the probate code writes out the words that are in the documents. And so one that says this is durable would be a statutory power of attorney. However, you you might have seen some on the Internet. There's also a legal Zoom or, or even at the stash, uh, stationery stores we used to be able to purchase pre-printed forms. And they may not all say the same thing. If, if so, there's one document that I would recommend that people do not try to do on their own, it is the durable power of attorney. You know, it's such a powerful document. You need an attorney there uh, to help you draft it and understand it. Uh, that's a really good point because the statutory form basically says I give my um, agent the authority to do these things A through N, such as buy on margin and select options. What does all of that even mean and why is that relevant to you? But what we find often is there uh, uh, banks and institutions and the IRS and credit cards won't accept these pre-printed forms because they don't specify the language. They don't specify their needed language. Um, one very important use of the power of attorney is to manage IRAs. A lot of us have our wealth in IRAs. Um, and a lot of IRA companies will in fact reject powers of attorney saying, well, it, where does it say the word you can direct required minimum distributions? I've literally had it where I had spouses come to me and the power of attorney for their ill spouse was rejected and we had to get a conservatorship, a conservatorship just to get the required minimum distributions started. Yeah, yeah. it's just a, it, and, and that's one of the important things to have a durable power of attorney between husband and wife because the spouse cannot get into the other mm -hmm. spouse's IRA account if um, if the person lacks capacity, you have to have a power of attorney. Um, talk a little bit about the importance of uh, understanding the immediate versus springing, because we have a medical industry out there, and and this is really important. Sure. So one important thing to know about your power of attorney is that if that it only comes to life if it says it's immediate upon signing or that it comes to life upon two doctor's letters or a doctor's letter stating the person is incapacitated. And that can be really detrimental. Let's say there's an emergency, something needs to be done immediately, we need money for care, but now we have to run around town and get two doctor's letters to make this power of attorney valid so that the agent can do the things that are needed for a person's care. It's terrible. So the thing is, is I have this discussion with clients. Do you really want an immediate power of attorney? This does say this person can act as my employee, my agent to do these enumerated things for me immediately. And that's a consideration, you know, between spouses. Sure, absolutely. Why wouldn't you? 
well, hopefully, but uh, uh, when it comes to springing powers of attorney, I'd say most of the time, younger folks, younger, healthier folks, and young can is is a subjective, you know, uh, uh, well, label. I'm going to bet 70 and under. <laughs> well, sure, exactly. But if you're but 70 I'll, and I'll over, say... you know, I think you ought to do an immediate. I'm just, uh, uh, it's the, it's very, doctors are very reluctant uh, to sign incapacity letters because of liability. And it's not easy to get two doctors to do that. And, 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 if, and if you feel like you, you want that security of a doctor's uh, letter before that power comes into being, then just get one doctor today, you know, uh, instead of two. But for most of us, it's uh, you don't want to have to declare your loved one uh, to be demented or lack capacity just to help them out with their checking account, for example. Uh, because uh, that power of attorney needs to be there at the bank if you're going to speak to the bank on behalf of someone else. Amen to everything Pete just said. And I want to uh, share a personal anecdote that, of course, when my mom and dad did their estate planning in their 60s, they did um, springing powers of attorney saying, no, kids, you, you stay out of our business until we're incapacitated. But when they approached 70, I had a talk with them and explained everything that Pete had just said that, you know, in an emergency, we don't want to run around town and get doctor's letters. And we don't ever want anybody to ever say that you're incapacitated. So yeah, prior to turning 70, they uh, then signed immediate powers of attorney so that when the day came and it did, that we needed to provide for care and pay bills. Well, we didn't have to go and ask anybody to say mom and dad lost their marbles. We didn't have to do that because they had already empowered us to act yeah. on their behalf. It's, it's, you know, it, I just had the situation where uh, for a person had a long-term care contract. Well, mm -hmm. a long-term care contract, you need to pay quarterly payments. And uh, they wouldn't accept uh, the uh, power of attorney. And it took six to seven months for them to accept the power of attorney um, on behalf of, of a client. And so luckily they didn't cancel the long-term care, care contract, but there's all sorts of issues from hospital bills to uh, insurance premium payments to cable TV to uh, 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 what else? Uh, banks. Uh, where Tax returns. A yeah. Big one. Um, credit cards uh, is another one. Uh, things that are titled in your own name and all of a sudden that are when you have a dementia or you lack capacity, you need the, is it called, if you're the agent, you, you're also the attorney. In fact, you need to do all this stuff for the person that you're acting on behalf of. Right. So let's start talking about who should that agent be? Well, it's got to be somebody who makes good financial decisions and has the time and availability to get on the phone and talk to a credit card company, the IRS or a bank. Or social um, security. <laughs> exactly right. And sit on hold for an hour. Yeah, exactly. Or two or three. Yes. So th that's the question, because some folks say, well, can't all of my kids be? co-agents. And you know, sometimes that's a terrible idea because banks hate it. Banks say, even though the document says they can act independently, banks say, nah, they all got to be here together and we don't want them. So one of you are, is going to act and the rest of you are going to uh, decline. So essentially banks have been directing people's powers of attorney. So do they, do they ever go out of date? One. Do they ever go out of date? Uh, powers of attorney for finances generally no, but banks are really nervous about accepting them because there's been so much fraud so, such that it, there's a potential. If you have an old one, and when I say old, I'm talking from the last decade uh, or the last century, um, 
it's likely that your agent is going to run into roadblocks and not be able to do the tasks that you've appointed them to do. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you, it, it, it's called like uh, the freshness. The bread gets stale, so do powers of attorney. And uh, you mm -hmm. may, once you have drafted uh, or have your power of attorney, take them to your financial institutions and get them to accept the power of attorney. A lot of times, uh, Bank of America, uh, Wells Fargo, they'll say, oh, well, this is nice to have your attorneys, but we have our own. What should a client do? <laughs> it happens more than once. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to go ahead. I mean, they've got your money. They hold the power, essentially. It's okay to sign their document, too. In fact, it's a good idea to yeah. sign their document, too, because you don't want to find out, you know, in the emergency situation, uh, they're, they're not happy with your document. Uh, your agent has to go and get a court order to act as your agent as a conservator. So, wow. yes, great advice. Once you've got your documents in place, you give them to your financial advisor, you give them to your banks. You put on here different agents for different tasks. That's right. What did I just say? That the person you select has got to be there available, boots on the ground, if possible, and available to sit on the phone, um, to go to a bank, uh, to be present, and to do these things for you. Do, think about, you know, uh, we're going to talk in a second about uh, agent for healthcare. That okay. is a totally different set of skills. Right, that that person has to be an advocate. That person has to be um, uh, uh, available for doctors and hospitals and compassionate to your particular wishes. This person is very much the left brain person, right? The 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 facts, figures, and numbers person. So that's why I'm saying you got to consider what the job is and who's going to be best suited. Successor agents. What do you mean by that? You can't just name one person. You don't know what the future holds. So I always insist that folks have three successors, one after the other. If this person can't, then this person will, and then this person. I'll share with you my, oh my goodness, I had a, a client who was 104 and she did a wonderful estate plan, except that she outlived everybody that she named in there. So guess what happened when she was in need? She needed a conservatorship because none of her agents were still available yeah yeah it's uh yeah one of the things that you've got to be concerned about um powers of attorney for finances powers granted by law what does that mean well i had said that there's something out there called the statutory power of attorney and it lists a through n these are the things that an agent under a power of attorney can do but i really want folks to think about what is the role of your agent what are they going to do are they going to be for example uh making sure that your pet is taken care of that your adult dependent child is going to be uh taken care of or grandchildren even or do you uh, have a power to gift power to gift extremely important especially uh if medicaid is ever going to be a consideration Folks come to me with a power of attorney and say, I want to transfer to mom's house to me because she needs to qualify for skilled nursing in a, in a medical facility. And maybe it is in that person's best interest to receive medical. But we can't do any transfers that might be allowed by medical because nobody has authority to do it because the document doesn't say so. Yeah. So, what, if, what, so, what about a person who's single or it doesn't have three people? Or uh, is this something that you should do and give uh, to a friend and have them do it for you? It's it's a possibility, but we all we's got to think about when we are having health and other issues. Our contemporaries are as well. So I always recommend, hey, you know, who do you have in a, in the younger generation? I wish that lady who was 104 years old had thought about persons other than Maybe her a niece contemporaries. or a nephew that could have the time. Exactly. And for those folks, some of us, we, we just don't have anybody responsible or capable or available. Yeah. And so what we're looking at now a lot, I'd say every other estate plan that I do, uh, there's reference to a private 
professional yeah. fiduciary. A, yeah, we're going to we're going to talk about that in the last session, but there's approximately 60 plus professional fiduciaries in Orange County. And I recommend highly if you want to re uh, hire a professional fiduciary, talk to your attorney, somebody like Christina, who has experience with a variety of different professionals and can understand your situation and can make a recommendation as to who you ought to interview. So there's professionals out there who do this for a living. Uh, so you don't have to be alone. There's also some trust companies will, most don't. Uh, so uh, uh, you're giving a lot of power to another individual, that legal authority. By the way, when you give legal authority to another individual, do you look at how the asset, like the bank account or the house, how that is titled first? Exactly right. Because this document only covers those things, uh, assets and liabilities that are not in the trust. The only person who is going to manage any assets in the trust are the trustees. And so that's the conversation that I had with clients. So when somebody is uh, managing as your power of attorney, here's the things that they're going to do for you. It's not usually not going to be the house if there's a trust. It's usually not the investment accounts if there's a trust. It's going to be the IRA because only an individual can own an individual retirement account. It's going to be the bills. It's going to be the credit cards. It's going to be um, the insurance. Yes. What, there's a new thing out there that allows people to transfer their home by title transfer on deed yeah uh, the transfer on death deed that's yeah, that, right talk a little bit about that which your my thoughts are it's too simple too easy i discourage people of, from doing it but i would well, love to get is, your we I'd don't like know to, what the future holds so let's say you know this grandchild is the beneficiary of this house you want that you know that when you die this is what you want okay great wonderful fine but we don't hold a crystal ball what happens if something happens to that child? How do, where does it go? It goes to probate. Why would you do that? Why would you do that to your loved ones? That's why you want a trust that says this uh, gift goes to this person. But if something happens to this person, then this is what happens to my estate. And it never goes to probate. Folks, it costs about 15 grand to probate a home in Orange County. What a waste. What a waste. You worked hard for, for your estate. So Why you would waste? discourage people from doing a transfer by deed? Right. For the reason that I said it doesn't allow for succession in unexpected situations, but also there's a lot of room for fraud. There's a lot of room for fraud. Yeah. Uh, it's not unheard of that um, there's a notarized document that's been forged. Oh, I have a forgery case right now where there's a notarized document. I, I want to, I want to, there's a question that we have. So I want to bring us back to the power of attorney side of this thing. Okay. I understand that I, there's an issue of if you select someone who is out of the area, that may, may be more difficult for them to assist. Mm -hmm. Is there an issue when that crosses a state line? So the person's in Atlanta, in Georgia, and you're in California. Is that a legal issue? So, Absolutely, somebody out of state can and does serve as your uh, agent under power of attorney. Um, a lot of things can be done online. A lot We're doing stuff online right now. So we know that the world has become really automated, but there are those instances where there has to be boots on the ground doing something. I had an issue where I had somebody in Connecticut and there was a safety deposit box here. And as attorney, I tried to communicate with them and say, could I just go in her stead? Uh, she could issue me a power of attorney. And they said, no, you're not the power of attorney for that person. Only the power of attorney has the authority to come in and look at that box. So that was an instance where it just wasn't suitable. So that's Empty again. deposit boxes. I wish they would go away. <laughs> oh my goodness. Put it in your that's mattress. A, no, <laughs> that's not legal advice. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, but title, 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 please understand title. So uh, a lot of people, uh, uh, what if, what if a person has a, a, a title in joint tenancy 
how does a power of attorney work? Exactly. Isn't that terrible? So what does joint tenancy mean? It means that whoever is the survivor takes all. That's what that means. And so uh, if you have a, a um, an intention that uh, an asset be shared amongst several people, no, that's not what's going to happen when you are no longer. Now, uh, the problem with a joint tenancy and a power of attorney is, well, it only if you specify, only if it says in the document that this covers any assets that are held in joint tenancy. So we're, that's absolutely a difficulty. Yeah, we're going to go into trust and titles some more next week when we talk about wills and trust. But generally here in Orange County, you want to put as you want to put all your assets in the name of the trust. And you need a good reason why you don't have it in the trust. So, but we're going to be talking about that more when we talk about wills and trust. Right. So what we should um, move on to is how that this is a revocable document. You can restate it as many times as you want throughout your lifetime. I Since it's such a powerful document, I'd say take it out and look at it like every three years. Honestly, every three years. Is this person still capable and the best selection? Did they move to Atlanta, Georgia or wherever? Um, the other thing you need to know is this power of attorney ends on death that uh uh you can you know the call the call i get usually is this is that my mom died this morning can i go to the bank and get the money out because i'm the power of attorney <laughs> and the issue and the answer of course is no you can't the death search shows the time and the date is signed you're committing fraud if you try to use this document after death that's right that's why we have a a whole binder full of documents, right? We have a will, a trust, a power of attorney, and an advanced health care because each document does a different job for you at a different time. Now, I want to talk about something we said. When you get your power of attorney, take it on down to the bank and make sure that it's acceptable to them. Or if they have a power of attorney of their own that they want you to use, then do it. Now, I'll share with you, there is a law that says if you have a valid power of attorney and they refuse to, some bank or institution refuses to take it, then they can be liable for any suit to enforce it. I've used that threat. And the bank said, yeah, go ahead, see what happens. So <laughs> there's this law that protects us, but is generally unenforceable. Banks and institutions got a bunch of attorneys who, you know, uh, are, are it'll, it'll, it'll be a year or two before you get in the to get it resolved so in other words don't fight city hall on this <laughs> Just, you know go ahead and sign their documents pers is another one that wants their form to be used so uh you know very important yeah it's for, um we're going to go into the advanced health care directive but if you have any questions on powers of attorney uh, please uh, write down your questions and we'll get to them uh, uh, just a little bit later on in the program. All right. So powers of attorney for healthcare, also known as advanced health care directives, are a totally different skill set and a totally different uh, realm of decision making. We were talking about taking care of bills, taking care of finances, taking care of business on your behalf, but the agent for healthcare is probably the most important selection that you're making. This is the person who tells doctors and hospitals what your wishes are for care should you become unable to communicate with doctors and hospitals. This includes the pull the plug, right? This includes uh, whether or not you receive life support and whether or not if you are on life support, you're going to sustain on life support. And, you know, these are really hard questions. Who wants to ever think about being incapacitated and not being able to uh, make decisions for oneself? But when thinking about who would step into your shoes to make these personal care decisions for you, you got to think, are they going to hold up? under pressure? Um, can they make difficult decisions in a difficult circumstance? And most of all, are they going to um, adhere to your wishes even if they don't want to? Yeah. 
Yeah, if you know, uh, I had two sisters that are devout Catholics, and she felt that uh, if she signed a DNR or um, a, a basically said allow her sister to die peacefully that she would be committing a mortal sin and she couldn't do it we literally had to call in a priest to counsel her and to finally change her mind because her sister was down to 90 pounds her third bout of uh, radiation and chemotherapy and she was in misery and so you really have to understand who you pick and what their religious beliefs are. And can they put their own beliefs aside and follow your wishes because it's your life? Exactly right. Tough choices you've got to make it ahead of time. But this is the reality that, that we need to plan for these things. I want to take a step back for a second and talk about capacity. I kind of glossed over it earlier, but this is a good juncture. Who has the ability to make these kind of decisions and, and sign these kind of documents? So again, I said that mini mental has nothing to do with whether a person can create an estate plan of their own. Um, what we know is that capacity applies separately to different categories. And I might find a person who absolutely can select somebody to make their medical decisions, but maybe they can't make decisions about who they would leave their estate to. So capacity to sign these documents are is a, a well, I'll share with you the different levels of legal capacity. So on the top of the chain is um, contractual capacity. This is where you understand the alternatives and uh, the results of decisions that you make for finances or other complicated decisions. The next one would be considered um, medical capacity because you do need to know the results of the decisions that you are making and you do need to know what the alternatives are gonna be. But I would say that selecting somebody to be your agent and to stand in your shoes is testamentary capacity, testamentary capacity, which is, do you know what you own? Do you know who your family is? And do you know that you're signing estate plan documents while you're signing it? It's very simple, a very simple level of capacity. Um, however, we always, always, always have to be considerate of undue influence. Undue influence is another uh, issue that affects capacity. So yeah. if uh, I've heard of stories during the pandemic where people were doing estate planning by Zoom and off to, off to the side where the attorney didn't see, there was somebody holding up yes and no signs and, and making signals to people. We're gonna see a lot of litigation about uh, undue influence during COVID. Um, but to segue back to what we're supposed to be talking about today is I find that um, Capacity can show itself in different ways at different times of the day. For most of my seniors over over seventy eight, I'd say that they're their sharpest. You know, earlier in the day, um, maybe about three o'clock. Uh, I'm not going to be talking to the same client that I would have at noon. In fact, there's a there's a whole dementia that starts. You know, they call it sunset. Uh, yeah, you know. And the other thing too is is, is it's it's it, we're not incapacity 24 seven, you know, just like you said, there are times where we're pretty lucid and we understand and two hours later, it could be completely different. But I always want to talk a little bit about the undue influence because people believe that okay, it comes from the caregivers or the outside of the family. Yes, that happens sometimes but it's usually family members who have an uh, undue, compa undue, undue influence over mom or dad. And, so, you and know- And sadly, I, it happens behind closed doors, right? Yes. Most of it happens behind closed doors where we don't see it. It usually doesn't happen in my conference table in front of me. And no. so, you know, it, it, it's a difficult thing. Um, but we all have to say that all of us are influenceable. Every human being is influenceable, but it's a question of, is the influence undue? undue. 
Yeah. And undo is defined by, are you doing something that you absolutely would not have done except for the pressure that's exerted upon you? For example, are you leaving everything to a nephew when you have children who've been in your life all of your life and suddenly the nephew moves in and uh, uh, de declines phone calls and visitors and keeps everybody away? Yeah. That's or, a good indicator. Of or you, uh, you have given everything equally and then all of a sudden uh, you decide to give it to one or another and exclude um, uh, individuals and you can't articulate as to why. So uh, there's a lot of red flags that come up, uh, but uh, uh, the courts are, uh, here in Orange County anyway, undue influence is just a major, major issue. And Christina, you're predicting that it's even going to get worse because of COVID. I think so, because there was a lot that went on behind closed doors, a lot of isolation. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I'm, uh, I, I do believe that there was a lot of rushing and and maybe not sitting down with clients. I did my very best, you know, I, I did my best. I uh, did consultations out in the courtyard in front of my uh, uh, building as much as I could. Yeah. But um, turning back to capacity, if we could, I want to sure. uh, point to the last thing on my list. So I said the marriage? highest level of capacity is contractual <laughs> marriage. All you have to do to get married is be able to breathe and say, I do <laughs> or I don't. That's it. That's the least amount of capacity needed. To but the reason I'm bringing up the different levels of capacity is there something new that I want to bring up? It's called uh, supported decision making supported decision making. So our uh, uh, legislature in its infinite wisdom decided that folks could just appoint someone to be their agent with, without, without these documents. Now, I, I'm, I'm afraid of uh, this new arrangement. I think that uh, there's a lot of um, room for fraud. Um, the other problem with supported decision making is that I don't believe that banks are going to accept this. I don't think that even um, hospitals are going to feel comfortable pulling the plug because somebody this is has brand been... new legislation, I believe, isn't it? It, it just passed this year. That's yeah. right. So uh, again, we're talking about undue influence. We're talking about capacity. So um, it allows we... just the person named to assist in making decisions for the individual that may lack capacity. That's right. But the extent to where uh, uh, the, the person can act independently, I'm fairly certain it's not going to be an effective use. So um, what I'm, I'm um, saying to folks, if you hear more about this supported decision making, I don't believe that it's a substitute for your power of attorney, your advanced health care and yeah. your revocable living trust. These documents on their own have issues. So <laughs> bring, bring up Thank more. you. you know, so, it's, 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 it's sad in a way that family problems and issues have to be solved in a legal court. And we wish it could be different, but we're talking about money. And money sometimes in a family is the poison that destroys it. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, you, you, if you have some wealth, uh, you know, then and here in Orange County, you know, one home and you probably have more wealth in, than the rest of the country. So uh, uh, it's 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 really important to have these documents done well and with an experienced attorney because they can they understand the problems. Christina goes to court and hears them all. <laughs> And, so, and it curls my hair some days. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so getting really back to what Pete was saying uh, um, um, about uh, why these documents are so dang important and you want to have the right ones. Um, for advanced healthcare, however, one of the things that we started seeing is um, the, the um, healthcare insurers, Kaiser, Blue Cross, uh, Aetna, they have come up with their own power of attorney for um, health care. And I have found that those are pretty good. Uh, however, I'm concerned about whether other um, um, 
healthcare providers will accept it. I have heard from uh, doctors in emergency room situations that they're most comfortable with this, in this case, the statutory advanced healthcare because it says, boom, here's the agent, boom, pull the plug or not, and boom, uh, here's my other wishes. Um, whereas these um, advanced healthcare from Kaiser or wherever, they're about 12 pages and em emergency room doctors don't have time, they say, to flip through 12 pages to find out, do, does the person want intubation or they, not? They want forms that they're familiar with. And uh, therefore right. the statutory and the California Medical Association one yes are probably the two most important ones to use. It's not to say that others aren't valid. It's just like the powers of attorney that we were talking about for finance. You know, uh, I you want to use the institutional one because they understand that one. It's the same with the medical one. It's mm -hmm. uh, uh, the California Medical Association one you can get online. It's I think it's $10. And uh, I just keep it up to keep it up to date. Exactly. Uh, also, uh, some folks do have extensive um, narratives about here's what I want for my final wishes, and here here's my important religious observations uh, for my healthcare decisions, and that's great. And where I put that with clients is in an addendum. The five wishes is an example of one. I use something called your way that, that kind of goes into, well, what do you want for palliative care? What are your values at end of life decision making? So again, I think it's best to use the statutory, the California Advanced Healthcare Directive form, but you can uh, uh, add an addendum that, that reflects your personal values and wishes. And I think you should a customize a question, it as much as possible. A question on that. So um, it, are, the, are the state documents or the standard state document in California, for instance, are those applicable in other states? Yes, because uh, we have a, a full faith and credit uh, uh, federal observation of contracts from other states. So yes, your California documents are enforceable in other states. However, if you're going to move out of state or spend a significant time uh, out of state, it's okay for you to have a Georgia power of attorney as well as a California power of attorney. Because let me tell you, the laws vary greatly from state to state to state. Us Westerners kind of have the, you know, uniform rules and laws about uh, healthcare and, and, and powers of attorney. But let me tell you, go back East and they've got like a, a whole separate set of rules. One thing that um, I have found that in the West, we are far more superior in um, recognizing fraud, undue influence, and elder abuse. Back East, they don't have very well-developed laws. So I think uh, uh, that's one reason why you want to visit an out-of-state attorney if you're going to spend a significant time. Yeah, my mother-in-law spent a lot of time with her daughter in Hawaii. And so the recommended that the daughter get an advanced healthcare directive under Hawaiian law, because in the event that she has to go to the hospital, it's the doctor that has to recognize that you have the power. And if they don't, uh, they may not be familiar with a California document and time is usually an issue. And so they want to be able to speak to someone who can make decisions uh, on behalf of their patient. Now, speaking of that, if the person, if they feel that you don't, uh, let's say you are the agent for healthcare for someone and you don't know their prescription drugs that they're on, you don't know if, if the difference between palliative and hospice care, you haven't talked to them in the last two years about their health care, the doctor doesn't have to listen to you. And they, if they believe that you don't have enough information or uh, that you're not up to date as far as the, his or her patient uh, as to what they need or want. And by the way, if you're the principal, you're the person in the hospital, 
your agent doesn't have any power so long as you're able to communicate with the doctor. So, and the doctor understands what you're telling them. So this is only in the event when you, again, when you suffer an incapacity. Now, remember when you come out of an operation, I just had a knee replacement. The first two hours after my knee replacement, I'm not, I don't, I lack total capacity because I'm under. So if there was an emergency in that situation, my agent, my wife, would have to make decisions for me. Is it right? And that's a good point, uh, Pete, isn't it? That what we were saying about capacity, it can be fluid, it can be situational, and it varies. It, it, and it, it, it can, yes, it can get worse, but it can also get better. Yeah. Don, you had a question? Yes. And I think it was the last slide mentioned the five wishes document. Is that still valid in California or, or sufficient? It is, but let's talk about what makes a document valid in California. It's gotta be properly executed. That's the biggest challenge I see to powers of attorney being invalidated. So the two things, either it's signed and dated and notarized, or it's signed and dated and witnessed by two disinterested parties who watched the person sign the document. So long as uh, uh, a doctor or a hospital can understand the instructions and it has been properly executed as stated here, then even the five wishes can be recognized by doctors and hospitals. So, There's so, no requirement that it come in any particular form, but what we're communicating is you want your doctors and hospitals to understand it, you know, in order to be followed. So, okay, let's distinguish this a little bit more. This document gives another person the legal authority, the legal authority to make decisions on your behalf if you lack capacity. However, what does the person need to know to make those decisions? You have to have had a conversation about death. You have to have a conversation about dementia, about uh, uh, Parkinson's disease. You have to have a conversation about, do you want to die in the hospital or do you want to die at home? You have to have that conversation as to understand if you're an agent for another individual, what they want. And it's not a 10 minute conversation. It's an hour, two hour conversation as to uh, lots of issues to discuss. Do you want more morphine, even though it may hasten your death? You know, I for me, give me that morphine. You know, uh, what do you want me to do if I'm demented and I have uh, um, another illness? Uh, you know, it's it's there's you've got to you've got to talk to another. And by the way, you change as you get older. You know, you don't think exactly the same way. I think totally different than I did at 50. So, and I'm more than likely if I get to be 85, 90, I'll think a little differently than I do today. So you have to keep that agent informed and please don't name somebody from out of state. Sometimes it's even difficult if you name somebody in LA and you're in the hospital here in Orange County Try to try to get here in two to three hours, you know, on the freeway. So have have talked to the individual who you planning on naming on. Do you have the time? Do you have the willingness? Do you have the energy? Do you understand the medical issues that are going to be involved? The you know, it's no longer your primary physician. You go into a hospital, you're with a hospital list, and they don't have time to read reams of documents. They want that agent, that advocate to say, okay, this is the past medical history. This is what's gone on. And if you haven't talked to the person about that, they won't know. And that emergency doctor doesn't know exactly what to do. So uh, it's this is all about you 
and you need to take care of this for yourself. From my point of view, this is the most important document of all four documents that we're going to be talking about because it has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with health. That's Agreed. my spiel. <laughs> Agreed. No, I, I fully endorse what you just said. Uh, let's go back into some of the technicalities. All right. So we said that it's great. You've got some document and you've expressed your wishes and you've appointed somebody, but you got to make sure it's a valid document. We had said that, um, yes, it's okay to use the statutory form. We said that sometimes Kaiser and um, Blue Cross Blue Shield want to use a particular document, but most often I see these documents fail because they're not properly executed. One thing you got to uh, be cautious of is you're not going to have your uh, agent sign as your witness either. They've got to be disinterested persons. I, I understand it's in one end of the, one of the individuals has to be disinterested. Is that correct? Or uh, no, it has to if be you two. have. Yes, yes, you can have an interested person sign as a witness, but then you have to get yet another person why bother why bother and what were we talking about undue influence why would you let one of your agents sign your document as a witness okay. come on um, let's go to the next slide all right so there's a there's a there is a form on the very end of an advanced health care directive for folks who are physically in a skilled nursing home at the time that they sign their advanced health care. And this is a little tricky thing. You got to get the county ombudsman to come on down to a skilled nursing facility and be the witness to yes. that one to make it valid. The other thing I want to share with you is uh, Pete had asked me, do powers of attorney go out of style or uh, do they uh, get stale? or uh, expire. Advanced health cares before 1992 actually did expire. So again, dust off these documents if you have them, check them for their date and check to make sure, does it still state what your wishes are? Yeah. Did you ask to be uh, kept alive under every circumstances and then cryogenically frozen and reanimated when technology allowed? Well, maybe you wanted that when you were 50, but what do you want at 75? Yeah. Let's go to the next slide. All right. The other HIPAA. thing that we have to be wary of is the HIPAA. How can your agent for healthcare make any decisions about healthcare if they can't see your medical information? The Healthcare Privacy Act made things really tough for doctors and hospitals to communicate to any other person aside from the patient. So your healthcare directive must have a HIPAA waiver. Yeah, and most new documents have that built in, but if you have an old document, it may not be. So make yep. sure you cannot get medical records without a HIPAA release. Disposition of bodies. All right, this is very important also, right? I had said that you can put any amount of information into your um, into your healthcare directive. Uh, if you have instructions for burial, it, it can be listed here on this document. But um, the one, this is the one document, the one power of attorney power that exists after death. The person who has the healthcare power of attorney is the person who can make the determination as to whether you have an autopsy, whether you're cremated and whether you're buried. So that power still is in existence. So speaking of that, should you name somebody different under the healthcare versus the finance? And how important is it for them to get along? Huh, exactly right. So if your healthcare agent has decided that, oh, maybe you would benefit from a nice placement at uh, name somewhere great, Wellington or something like that. Very expensive, very elegant care. Um, but your uh, trustee thinks, nah, you're good enough for Medi-Cal, go to a skilled nursing home. So that's, that's a really tough situation where uh, your agent uh, really needs to be able to make health care decisions but you also have somebody who's fiscally responsible. Yeah, I will not serve if uh, uh, under the healthcare agent if I'm not the power of attorney or trustee just for that reason. 
Right. Care costs money. Yeah. That's the reality. Care costs yeah. money. And a lot of times what I find is, is that some of the kids don't want to spend the money uh, the kind of a conflict of interest because they don't want to spend the money where it should be spent, the person who owns it, and because they're literally cutting into their own inheritance. There's a built-in conflict there, and you need to be aware of it. Again, this is not all families, hopefully a small minority of families, but it does happen, and we see it every on a regular basis. Um Autonomous Coke gifts. Well, by the way, we all have about uh, we have about fifteen minutes left, Christina. So I want to make right, sure we go in. over the the. Yeah. Uh, so we've talked about powers of attorney for finances. We've talked about advanced healthcare directives, but let's talk about how the trust plays into selecting an agent, selecting a fiduciary. So we and then we want to go in. We got to we want to go a little bit into conservatorship and why we should avoid it. Oh yes. We'll we'll have plenty to say about that. Okay. So today's uh, subject um, is limited to who is the trustee. All right. So uh, the person who is your trustee, what decisions do they make? They don't decide anatomical gifts like in the previous slide. They don't decide how uh, uh, who's going to be your doctor, hospital, or where you're going to receive your care. But they manage the money that is in the trust. This is both possibly during your lifetime and then after you've passed away. Now, this is one scenario where we can have co-agents and it tends not to be as difficult because banks and institutions recognize the section that says they can act independently. They don't have to be both in the bank at the same time doing the same thing. Except for real estate. <laughs> Except for real estate. Yes, thank you. That if uh, a home is owned by a trust, then all the trustees must sign yeah. for sales and encumbrances. Right. I discourage co-trustees. I, you know, if you, people a lot of times believe that this is a, a, a position of honor and hey, it's a job. yeah, it's a job. And, you know, I can't tell one of my kids that I've chosen another one because they're going to misinterpret it that I have more faith in them than I do other. And so, Hey, let's name them both as co-trustees. That's the worst reason to name co-trustees. Uh, talk to the attorney. Talk to your attorney about the kids. They can help you choose one or the other and then name the other as the successor. Exactly. And that's another point that you always want to name successors because in order to have a valid trust, there are several things you must have. You must have property, you know, must have a purpose, and you must have a trustee. Your trust fails if you don't have anybody to act as yeah. trustee. If we're named in a trust, we even ask the uh, uh, the grantor, the person who's drafting the trust, to give us the power to name a successor so that, because uh, you just don't know what the future holds. And, and that's an excellent point that I think every other trust that I've created, uh, I said, I usually am uh, listing private professional fiduciaries, but the question always comes up, what happens if something happens to them? Most of the private professional fiduciaries have a succession plan in place, but it doesn't name that successor in the document unless we've said give the fiduciary or the last serving trustee the ability to select a replacement. Because if you don't, you know where we go? To get a replacement trustee, we have to go to court. And that's Ooh. expensive you and wanna, time consuming. You, you want to skip over and go right into conservatorships because we're going to spend some, quite a bit of time on trust. Yay, All right. there you go. Conservatorships. You so want to avoid them. <laughs> we want to avoid them for the reason that they are time consuming, they are public, it's before the court, it's intrusive, and most of all, it is very, very expensive. So there's different types of conservatorships. These are, I describe them as court ordered substitutes for powers of attorney. So when does, uh, when does this occur where there is no power of attorney, where the person lacks capacity, where perhaps there were powers of attorney created, but we uh, they're invalid because the agents can't work together um, because 
perhaps there was fraud or undue influence in the execution of the documents. So conservatorships can be um, described, there's at least three different kinds of conservatorships that we have here in California. And the most common one is the probate conservatorship or general conservatorship. There's also limited conservatorships and those are just for folks who are developmentally disabled, you know, young folks who were determined to be disabled before age 18. There's also LPS conservatorships, and these are very limited. These are uh, the mental health conservatorships, and this is for mental health treatment in a mental health facility or psychiatric treatment with um, psychotropic drugs. And uh, those types of conservatorships we don't deal with very often because those are only in initiated by the county. But uh, for general conservatorships, which is what we're going to talk about today, there's two different dimensions of conservatorships. There's conservatorship of the person and conservatorship of the estate. Conservatorship of the person takes the place of that advanced health care directive if it didn't exist or it failed. And conservatorship of the estate uh, takes the place of the power of attorney for finances that didn't exist or failed. And there's a next slide. Here you go. Conservatorship of the person entails where the person lives, is cared for, and generally is available to persons who cannot provide for their own food, shelter, uh, at clothing, or consent to medical care. But this is something interesting. We have said that sometimes a power of attorney exists and then a conservatorship is established. And there's many reasons why that might happen. But unless the advanced health care directive is um, suspended, then that person is still there and can make decisions about health care. So that's, that's an interesting quirk in the law to be aware of. Often conservatorships are established because the person suffers from dementia. And so when I hear, hear that a person has dementia and needs a conservatorship, the next question is, but what care do they need for that dementia? So uh, one important thing to know is people can't be placed in a secure perimeter um, facility without special neurocognitive disorder powers. They were formerly known as dementia powers. That means placing somebody against their will in a care facility. Uh, for memory care where they can't just leave. And there's also, huge, it, this, is a, this is a huge problem because we're more aware of dementia today than we've ever been, but locking somebody up in a secure environment, uh, you know, it, it, that's a It's a constitutional right to have yeah, liberty. Yeah, exactly. You know, but I'm sorry. I mean, this, this is real life and death stuff. Right. We have folks who are physically well, very healthy, but suffer from dementia and wander. And then we see all these silver alerts and it's situations like this that, well, what do you think you need? Well, to place the person in a secure perimeter, but you can't put people in lockup against their will without a court order and a finding that this is the least restrictive alternative for their care. Can, can also, you name you're uh, the person that you want to be your conservator today when you're in good health. Exactly. So and, and uh, how most, do you do that? Most advanced health care directives and powers of attorney say, if I need a conservator of my person, if I need a conservator of my estate, here's who I nominate. And folks ask me, no, I never want a conservatorship. I don't want this section in my uh, uh, documents at all. And I explain, hey, you don't know what the future holds. Yeah. You don't know what the law is is going to uh, change. And so we're creating documents that are valid here today, uh, but we don't know what a bank might do or what a, a fraudster might do. And, and so it's in your best interest to nominate. Yeah, and we don't know who amongst us is going to end up with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or, or the variety of other diseases. Uh, that's... You know, we don't know what our genes are. And so we need to be prepared and to name that, that person. Because if you don't name a person, are there any family members that go to court and uh, fight to, uh, to be the conservator? 
Britney Spears, man, for example. <laughs> man, uh, let me tell you, I've 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 been involved in some doozies, so I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. You see, if you don't name them, there might be a fight in the family. Who gets to be the conservator for you? And that's yeah, something you just don't want to happen. No, and so your best defense against all of that nonsense is to state in writing in a valid document. Here's my wishes. Next slide, um, please. All right. So we said conservatorship of the person is care of the person and determining placement and providing food, clothing, shelter, and medical care. So a conservatorship of the estate, on the other hand, is for somebody who is unable to manage his own finances and avoid fraud or undue influence. So this, I'll, I'll share an example of a, a case where I had somebody who had documents and who otherwise probably had capacity. This gentleman was still working and supporting him and his wife, but those uh, Jamaican lottery scammers got to him and he had sent $250,000 to these criminals. And in that case, it, it, he was subject to undue influence, even though otherwise he was fully competent and capable in caring for himself and his wife. But we needed a conservatorship to stop the bleed because those those con artists were so convincing. Oh, they're, they they're him, unbelievably the convincing. I had a woman like that too. She Even after we explained that this was a criminal act, she went behind our backs to get a hold of the individual to give them more money for the lottery. She believed that was absolutely true that uh, uh, this individual was going to make her a um, million dollars. But talk a little bit about how does a trust help avoid a conservatorship of the estate? Exactly right. Whereas a power of attorney is revocable, right? Trusts are revocable. However, only the trustee is able to act. Under a power of attorney, you still have control. You still can give away the fortune to the fraudsters. However, if you have a trust, then you can have even a co-trustee. And what did we say? That the, the co-trustee has to make decisions with you. Um, and and that's, that's one of the things that we do. I had talked about earlier, when do you make your powers of attorney um, uh, springing and immediate? Well, Pete said the cutoff date is age 70, but, but more importantly, you know, uh, if, if there's vulnerability, I often say, well, let's get, let's just select one of your kids to be co-trustees to help manage along with you. Doesn't take any power away from you. You still do what you want in life, but there's somebody else. Yeah. Out I get things. named as a co-trustee a lot of times that, uh, just to prevent the big mistake from for the you know giving away the house or the the major uh um uh the fortune but these are great resources uh i love the your way booklet i use it all the time i recommend it to people uh i recommend that you use it and have a, a small sips of glass of wine while you're doing it it's a conversation it's not a test uh the pulse is for somebody who's in the last year of life. It gives your doctor the a physician's order as to what uh, a, a life or death decision and what kind of care you're going to receive. Um, but that's- And it's a medical form, right, Pete? Yeah. It's not a legal form. This is not for your uh, attorney. This is for your doctor. Yeah, so- Anyway, let's open it up for, uh, first of all, Christina, great. We did it in an hour and a half, <laughs> an immense amount of, of information. And uh, 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 those are resources, again, for the National Academy. Uh, do we have any questions, Don? Uh, we can't hear you, Don, because you're uh, muted. There you I've, go. I've been very efficiently answering them. Christina, do you want to stop sharing? There you go. All okay. right. A moment ahead of you there. So good. Very good. Uh, okay. do you, anybody have a question? Wait, or before we do that, before we do that one, Pete. Okay. I would like to thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn off the camera in a moment. So thank you very much for being here with this session on It's Your Estate. Next week, we will dive deeply into wills and trusts. 
And I thank you all for being here and have a good time. And the camera is...